Today we are going to continue talking about mood disorders. Um, starting with, we were in the middle of talking about major depressive disorder, and um, we'll talk about some seasonal affective disorder or uh, major depressive disorder that uh, changes depending on the seasons, and then um, bipolar disorder as well. So we have started talking about the biology of what we know about the biology and genetics and, and everything behind major depressive disorder. And we have not yet talked about neurotransmitters, which is an important thing to uh, discuss when um, talking about, I'm just gonna start calling it depression as I, as I often do. So um, one of the things that's, uh, I think I've mentioned this before in this class, but I think I should state clearly here as, as your author does that um, usually what happens is we find a medication that works and then we go and try to figure out how it works. And then we realize that it, I mean, because the medication is influencing these um, receptors in our brain, then we go and figure out what are the endogenous chemicals in the brain that are having the same effect. And um, I'm gonna start by talking about uh, tricyclics. And this is not going completely in historical order, which I tend to like to do. The tricyclics did come around pretty early. So imipramine uh, that um, blocks the reabsorption of serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. So it is the um, one of those uh, reuptake inhibitors, but it is for three different neurotransmitters, serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. Uh, and that was what we saw it working on, even though it works on monoamines. Okay, and those monoamines include um, epinephrine and histamine. And we also see an influence on acetylcholine of tricyclics. They're kind of a messy drug. And if I haven't said this before, I think I have with hopefully with um, smoking cigarettes with tobacco that um, it's a very messy drug. And one of the things we try to do with our drugs when we're trying to help somebody so that we're trying to get these prescribed drugs that are helpful to someone, we try to get them as clean as possible because that means fewer side effects. And so tricyclics also block histamine receptors, which means we're going to be sleepy. It um, blocks acetylcholine receptors, so we end up having a uh, dry mouth, and it blocks certain sodium channels, so we have heart irregularities as well. Um, the difficulty urinating, that's also due to um, acetylcholine receptors being, being blocked. And so we have other side effects as well. They're a messy drug. We try not to use them. People try not to use them. But if somebody is pretty treatment resistant with other um, antidepressants that we're going to look at, they might try them on tricyclics. And um, this was, they, tricyclics came around before the Prozac and Paxil and Wellbutrin and all of those ones that we tend to know these days. So they were here earlier in history. Usually the first line of defense is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, and that is because uh, this is a clean drug where the only thing we're really influencing is serotonin. And again, what we're doing is we're basically um, freezing that reuptake inhibitor so that uh, serotonin kind of, I'm not gonna say this quite the way it works in the brain, but it kind of bounces off. And instead of being pulled into pulled into the, the presynaptic neuron. And then, so that serotonin is staying in the synaptic cleft for longer to influence the postsynaptic neuron. Um, some of the most common ones are fluoxetine and paroxetine, uh, what we know as Prozac and Paxil. And they have fewer side effects because of this, how clean the drug is. If uh, SSRIs don't work, and I've mentioned SSRIs for a number of things now, but especially depression or major depressive disorder, we, they might try a, a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor or an SNRI, so Cymbalta or Effexor. Those have come along a bit later and they block the reuptake of both serotonin and norepinephrine. And then they've also got now these atypical antidepressants like um, Buprion or what's known as Wellbutrin. This blocks dopamine reuptake and to some extent norepinephrine, so working on the catecholamines and not the whole group of monoamines, and so serotonin is not included in that. Uh, for people who, um, this, who this works for, for whom this works, I'll say that correctly, syntactically, hopefully, a little bit, uh, this, uh, it's a different 
it really is a, a different way of um, treating depression and it suggests that something different is going on with with people for whom Wellbutrin works and those other ones don't work and usually again they start with the SSRIs not always but that's the what they typically do and then if if other if um, the SSRIs and the SNRIs don't work they might try the uh, atypical antidepressants or something like Wellbutrin if we look back historically, uh, one of the very first antidepressant drugs were they were monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So we've talked now a couple of times about monoamine oxidase, the enzymes that are in the um, terminal buttons that are breaking up the um, excess monoamines. And so that includes uh, serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine. And then the epinephrine and histamine, but really it's those the, the serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine are, are kind of the important ones for uh, depression. And those are um, metabolizing those into inactive forms because when we have an excess, what monoamine oxidase is just going in and, and, and taking those apart with the assumption that we're going to have some excess. And so um, the inhibitors, what the MAOIs do, or monoamine oxidase inhibitors do, that's the drug, they inhibit that enzyme. And so uh, now we have more of those, all of those monoamines available to affect the postsynaptic neuron. And that sounds like a really good thing, but um, monoamine oxidase, it is in other parts of the body and it is helping us metabolize other things in other areas of the body. And so now people who take MAOIs have to avoid foods that contain tyramine. So they are not allowed to eat things like, uh, but the only ones I remember are the ones that I would horribly, horribly miss, which is chocolate and, and red wine. <laughs> but there are other things that if they eat them, this can actually cause um, high enough blood pressure that it can kill them. So um, we try, or psychiatrists, people try to not use MAOIs unless really nothing else is working this was what they used more back in the 1950s, but this has been, been used less and less frequently as we have gotten better, cleaner drugs that aren't influencing this enzyme, which also has, again, is metabolizing other things. Another example of not an antidepressant drug, but something that is used as an, as an antidepressant, which is an herb, is St. John's wort. And so this is marketed as a nutritional supplement because it is an herb, which means it's not regulated by the FDA uh, at all. Um, usually it is, so psychiatrists, psychologists, counsel, well, counselors and psychologists can't prescribe, but um, doc doctors, if you go to your um, general practitioner, they might prescribe an antidepressant drug if, if your depression seems really straightforward and you don't wanna go see a psychiatrist. But they are not going to prescribe you St. John's Wort because the, there's nothing said about it in any kind of um, prescription drug atlas, and the FDA does not regulate it. So, uh, but people do use it as kind of an over-the-counter herbal supplement. The effectiveness, the percentage of people who are helped by St. John's Wort is about the same as standard antidepressants. However, what happens with St. John's wort and that we have to really keep aware of, and especially because it is over the counter, <laughs> is that it increases the effectiveness of a particular enzyme in the, lever, in the liver that decreases the effectiveness of other medications. So if you're on other medications, St. John's wort is not a good idea to take without consulting a physician for sure. So I have this question here under antidepressant drugs. Is any single drug producing any different effects than others? When we're looking at the overall effect of what's happening in the brain and when we're looking at just the um, percentage of people who are helped, it really does appear that certain antidepressant drugs help some people and other antidepressant drugs help other people, which means something slightly different is going on with those people. And what that is, I don't know, and I don't know how many of the psychiatrists and general practitioners really know. I know that when I went to a psychiatrist, he had me and two of my friends on different antidepressant drugs to start with. I started on Paxil, and a friend of mine started on Prozac, 
And another friend of mine was on tricyclics. I don't think that was the first thing he tried, but that was what she ended up being on. And um, it looked like he was asking specific questions about our um, sleep problems, but this is what psychiatrists do. He asked particular questions about the sleep problems, the type of depression, uh, our fatigue, how we were eating, and what kinds of anxiety we might be experiencing, whether it was generalized anxiety or social anxiety or no anxiety at all. And he uh, put us on different medications uh, based on what was he thought was going to help us the most. And I thought he did a pretty good job. But if you notice, Prozac and Paxil are in the same class of drugs. They're both SSRIs. And so why me on one and, and my friend on the other? I don't completely know. She did not have the same kind of anxiety symptoms that I that I had, but that's just that's just what he ended up doing. Do we we don't really seem to know uh, whether a single drug is um, having a different effect than other drugs or how they are affecting people, except what we do know is that antidepressant drugs are producing their effects on neurotransmitters in the synapse, and that occurs within minutes to hours, depending on the drug. So that change is happening very quickly, but if you've ever been put on an antidepressant, it takes, it says in the book, two or more weeks, it takes more than two weeks. The first time you're put on an antidepressant, it takes a few weeks before you experience any mood elevation or help from the antidepressant if you're within that whatever percentage of people, about 60 to 70% of the people who are eventually helped by some antidepressant drugs, it takes a while. And it takes less time the next time that you're put on it, but the very first time, it takes more than two weeks. And the question is, or the um, assumption is, that it is that the antidepressant drugs are affecting neurotrophins. So uh, in depressed people, the particular neurotrophin, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, is low. And we've talked about neurotrophins before when we talked about brain development. But brain-derived neurotrophic factor is specifically um, allows us to um, keep those neurons alive that are being produced through neurogenesis. And we see this is specifically or particularly important in the hippocampus, where there is still a great deal of neurogenesis as we age. And so what we see, if you've noticed, in people who are depressed is, are smaller hippocampi. Uh, so it looks like this is a pretty good idea of how antidepressant drugs and those changes in the neurotransmitters are in the longer run affecting the brain and what's actually helping people with their depression uh, is to um, raise the brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Because what we're seeing in people with depression are smaller, smaller hippocampus, impaired learning, and fewer new hippocampal neurons, or those neurons aren't, are not staying alive. And so this would, this would be changing that. So I have a couple of um, examples of um, articles, journal articles here. The research that's been done on this now, though, is quite a, quite a bit of research that suggests prolonged use of antidepressant drugs generally is increasing the BDNF, the brain-derived neurotrophic factor, um, that the production of BDNF, which improves learning and allows the formation of new synapses. And this process takes weeks, which matches the time course for behavioral recovery. Um, from depression when we start taking antidepressant drugs. I'm going to just say a few things here. So BDNF facilitates new, new learning that builds new synapses and removes old ones. This explains why people may profit from cognitive therapies as well, which I'm going to talk about very briefly, I hope. And a few antidepressant drugs improve mood without demonstrable effects on BDNF. So it, it could be that antidepressants are working in more, more than one way. So I'm going to take a step back and talk about the etiology of depression, which to some extent is what I've been talking about all along, except I stayed on really um, biological factors. And let's talk about cognitive factors. Some of this is not in the book, but I think it's important for understanding that um, people get to being depressed for various reasons, and there are different pathways to depression. One of the people who's looked a great deal into cognitive aspects of um, de major depressive disorder is Aaron Beck, and he came up with a couple of ideas that are pretty important for understanding uh, maladaptive thinking in, in people who are depressed. One 
is the negative cognitive triad. So um, people who are depressed tend to have negative thinking about themselves, about their situations, and about their future. I'm going to do this very colloquially because I think it expresses the basic idea. So people saying, I suck, my situation sucks, and my future is going to suck. It's bound to suck. Okay, so that's the negative cognitive triad. Uh, he also sees that a lot of times people who are depressed have a certain faulty logic. And in some classes, we talk about an internal locus of control versus an external locus of control, where an internal locus of control is my um, taking responsibility for um, where I am in my life, that I made decisions and I made, or I made mistakes or I did good things and I was the one who, who got me to where I am today. An external locus of control really puts that locus of control outside of oneself, where one might say something like, it's the um, people you know, it's the situation you're in, it's the powers that be, something else is controlling where I go in life. People who are depressed tend to have this logic of they have an internal locus of control for the negative aspects of their life. So when I do something wrong, when I lose my job, when I make a mistake, I'm saying, I'm saying I made a mistake. I did something wrong. I was the one who was at fault for losing my job or getting an F on this, on this paper or this test or whatever. People with depression also tend to have an external locus of control for positive aspects of their life. So I get an A on a test and I say, well, that's because the teacher grades easier. This was an easy class or that was easy material. Or um, I get a new job and I say, that's because of uh, I was lucky. And or the, it was the people I knew. It had nothing to do with my talents and ability abilities. So you can see the kind of faulty logic here where they're kind of beating themselves up for the negative aspects and not giving themselves they're due for the positive aspects. Another uh, cognitive factor is learned helplessness. So we see that animals who are in this situation where they're yoked to another animal and the other animal has the power of um, stopping a shock. So both animals are being shocked and one animal, I remember the dogs, they can like move their head up and to the left and, if, and they can stop the shock and those dogs learn to move their head up into the left but the dogs that are yoked to them they're just receiving shock and no matter what they do they have they have no explanation for the shock and there's nothing they specifically do to change that shock happening to them and so they basically learn to be helpless and we can put them in a whole new situation where they're in a crate and they could potentially jump to another side of the crate to get away from the shock at their feet, but those dogs who learned helplessness, who were yoked and didn't have any control, they are much more likely to just cower and whine and cry and to not jump to the safe side. And we see with animals that um, as they're learning, as rats and mice lear learn helplessness, as they have uncontrollable shock, we see changes in um, serotonin, levels, we see the same kinds of changes that we see in a human brain of people who are depressed. So if we look at the complexities in the simplest way and just kind of boil it down to the simplest things that we can, we have situational components, uh, we have interpersonal roots, so um, how we are relating with other people is uh, very influenced by um, whether or not we are depressed and typically we see a precipitating stress. As I mentioned, we usually have some kind of trigger for that first depression and it's the worst depression, but we continue often to have um, some kind of trigger or precipitating stress before these episodes of depression. So I'm gonna come back to this question of how effective are antidepressant drugs? Well, it depends. And what this figure shows is on the x-axis we have initial severity, so how, um, how bad basically was the depression? I think this was on the Hamilton scale. So they were rating the depression. And then we look at the percent improvement and uh, they're comparing the um, reddish triangles are people who are actually given an antidepressant drug and the blue circles are people who were given a placebo. And so these are studies 
that compared um, getting the drug to a placebo in that kind of nice experimental design. And what you'll see is if the initial severity was kind of low, which actually the, the Hamilton, whatever score study they use, I think it was the Hamilton score, um, is not really good with these lower severities. It's when it gets into being a pretty severe depression that yes, we can tell this person's severely depressed. But so those, the, the measures are not, they don't have a lot of consistency or maybe validity for these kind of just somewhat depressed move, mood. But um, if you'll notice at the lower initial severity and even pretty, like getting pretty high into 25, 27, 28, there is no difference, no significant difference between people who got the drug and people who got a placebo. And while uh, that purple area is showing where there was a clinically significant difference, if we put all the studies together, it kind of looks like the drugs were helping more than the placebos, but none of those within those studies was um, significantly different. And it was only as we move out to people who had a really high initial severity of depression that we see a, a significant effect of antidepressants over a placebo. So some of what happens is there is um, people spontaneously get better. Usually when we go and see a therapist, a psychiatrist, or a doctor about our depression, we are at a particular low in our depression, and so we're likely to get better to some extent. And so people are are likely to have some spontaneous. We go through we go through kind of cycles, and so it's not clear. And then there's also the placebo effect. The placebos actually do help people to some extent. So we're not we're not really distinguishing antidepressants from placebos all that well, unless that initial severity was pretty high. People were pretty severely depressed to start with. Your author talks briefly about psychotherapy as an alternative to, to medicine, and I'm going to just summarize what he says here because it's shown to be equally effective for all levels of depression. Um, we see just as much help from psychotherapy as we do from antidepressant drugs with three exceptions. One, drugs work better for dyslimia. People who have that long-term lifelong condition of just kind of unhappy mood, and they're just kind of below the line of, of um, homeostasis and equanimity, they are helped by antidepressant drugs or they tend to be the ones who are likely to be helped. Two, antidepressants are ineffective for sufferers of childhood neglect or abuse. This, there's a lot going into the, um, the stressors and the situation and uh, the assumption, the interpersonal, they need psychotherapy. And I'm not saying that antidepressants with psychotherapy wouldn't be helpful but antidepressants by themselves are not helping those people. Three, psychotherapy is more likely to reduce relapse months or years later. So people who get on antidepressant drugs, and there's gonna be a time most likely when they taper off and come off those drugs, and a lot of those people relapse. Even a lot of people who stay on the drugs, uh, the drugs just stop working as well. And so they tend to relapse. Whereas with psychotherapy, we are learning new ways of thinking, especially if we have some kind of cognitive behavioral therapy, which means we're less likely to relapse as we can um, rely on really new learning for how to deal with some of those interpersonal um, relations. And research shows that really people improve the most with a combination of drugs and psychotherapy. And in the next uh, lecture now, I need to, to end this so it's not too long and I can save it. <laughs> but about overall, about one third to almost one half of patients don't respond to antidepressants or psychotherapy. So we're going to see what we can do for these for this treatment resistant depression.